6.8, the inverse trigonometric functions. We know from trigonometry that a function such as the sine function must also have an inverse function. And in fact, we use that inverse function frequently in trigonometry and in calculus to solve equations for angles. So of course what I mean by that is I think of the sine function as being a function that takes an angle or a theta value and when I feed that angle into the sine function what I get back is a so-called trig ratio. So of course when I take the sine of pi over 6 radians which is 30 degrees I get 1 half. Okay what I would like of course for the sine inverse function to do is to take that trig ratio and get me back that pi over 6 number. So what we're thinking here is if the sine function is a function that maps a real number that I'm usually thinking of as, as an angle to one of those trig ratios, then the inverse function, which by the way is sometimes also called arc sine, should be a function that takes a trig ratio let's say a ratio of sides and a triangle back to the angle in that triangle. So that sort of guides how we're going to think about these inverse trig functions. And to actually build them we'll do it all visually. So let's look at this picture. And let's start out by looking at the sine function. Now as I look at the sine function, and of course I have the line y equals x graph there, I know that the graph of the inverse function should be a reflection of the sine function about that line. Okay, what's the immediate problem? The sine function is not one to one, and really this is the crux of what we're going to talk about in the first part of this section. To have an inverse function, my function has to be one to one. Um, otherwise, if I ask what's the sine inverse of 1, I'm going to get infinitely many output values for that. I know in this picture sine inverse of 1 would be pi over 2. It would also be negative 3 r pi over 2. And many, many more values. So the idea is when we get to the trig functions, we will restrict them to a particular domain. Uh, really what we're doing is we're charging, we're selecting the largest domain on which the sine function will be one-to-one -one and cover the entire range of the sine function. Okay, a convenient and natural choice for that would be the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. It's an interval on which the function is one-to-one, -one, contains zero, and it definitely covers the entire range of the sine function, which is negative one-to-one. So the process we go through for each of the six trig functions to define the trig inverse function is to restrict the domain, the natural domain, of the trig function to an interval on which the trig function is one to one. Once we've done that, we can simply reflect that graph over the line y equals x. When I do that in this picture, what I get in red is the graph of the inverse sine function. Uh, notice that the original sine function in blue has a domain of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, closed interval, has a range of negative 1 to 1. Therefore, what should the inverse sine function in red have as a domain and range? Well, the domain should be negative 1 to 1, so this is x equals negative 1 to x equals positive 1. And the range should be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, let's quickly just look through the pictures for the other functions just to make sure they make sense. Okay, so for example, here's the cosine function the interval to which we're going to restrict the cosine function is the interval 0 to pi. Uh, 
closed interval. Once I make that restriction, I can reflect that graph over the line y equals x. And now that red graph that you see is the graph of the inverse cosine function. Again, notice the domains and ranges. In blue, we have the restricted cosine function, whose domain is 0 to pi and whose range is negative 1 to 1. On the flip side, the inverse cosine function should have a domain of negative 1 to 1 and a range of 0 to pi. Same story for tangent, although tangent is a little bit different. Again, I'm going to have to restrict the tangent function to an interval on which the function is 1 to 1. And I know the range of the tangent function is all real numbers. And I can see that if I selected just one of those periodic pieces, namely that one, I'll have a function that is 1 to 1 and covers the entire range of the tangent function. So the restriction for the tangent function is the open interval, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. If I reflect that over the line y equals x, I get that red graph. That red graph is now the graph of my tan inverse function. Again, of course, what's the domain of tan inverse? It should be the same as the range of the blue tangent function, which is negative infinity to infinity. What is the range of the tan inverse function? It should be the same as the domain of the original tangent function, which is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which is why I know that on this tan inverse graph, there should be a horizontal asymptote at negative pi over 2 and a second horizontal asymptote at positive pi over 2. There's the graph of cotangent. Okay, now if we're trying to think about what restriction to do, I know I need to pick one of these pieces. The one we're going to select is that one. Notice what the graph looks like if I reflect it over the line y equals x. That red graph is the graph of cotan inverse. Okay, now the last two <clears throat> have unusual characteristics, not so much arc cosecant or cosecant inverse, but secant inverse is sort of the, the unusual one, as we'll see in the next few sections. But let's look at cosecant first. And if you recall, cosecant being the reciprocal of sine looks like this. So what's the restriction I want to use? I can't use just one of these pieces that look something like a parabola. They're not one-to-one. -one. They don't cover the entire range. I can see the range of the cosecant function is negative infinity to negative 1 closed union 1 closed to infinity. So the restriction I'm going to do is going to be a mix of half of one of those pieces in the bottom part of the graph and half of one of these pieces in the top part of the graph. So my domain restriction is closed negative pi over 2 to open 0 union open 0 to closed pi over 2. Obviously my domain cannot include 0. Cosecant of 0 is 1 over sine of 0, which is undefined. Okay, so we've made our restriction. Now I reflect over the line y equals x, and I see this red graph. And I'll leave it for you to make sense in the picture for yourself that the domains and ranges of those two functions match up the way they're supposed to. That is, is the domain of the restricted cosecant function the same as the range of the inverse cosecant function, and vice versa.
Okay, that leaves us with one last function. Oops. Sorry, too many things at once. So here's our graph of the secant function. Again, the reciprocal of the cosine function. We're going to do something similar to what we did for cosecant. We'll take half of this upper loop, half of this bottom loop. Our restriction is going to be the interval closed 0 to open pi over 2, union open pi over 2 to close pi. So it's the interval from 0 to pi excluding pi over 2. Now that we've made the restriction, we'll flip over the line y equals x. Look at that for a moment. Just convince yourself that's a reflection. Turn your head uh, clockwise about 45 degrees and you'll see it. And similarly, the domains and ranges will map up, match up as usual. And so now we're looking at the graph of the arc secant or secant inverse function. These functions, their graphs, domains, and ranges are summarized on this sheet. You'll find a reference like this in your book, and I'll also post this on Blackboard and or MyOpenMath where you have access to it. But as I said, there are pictures like this in your textbook as well. All six inverse trig functions with the appropriate domain restrictions and then the corresponding ranges. So let's make a few observations about these inverse trig functions. So first, let's go back to the sine function for a moment. And of course, just to remind us here, we know that the sine function is a function that takes, with our restriction, an angle or real number, but it, we think of it as an angle, between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 gives us back an output value between negative 1 and 1. And again, just to remind us, I know the sine function, the natural sine function, has a domain that's all real numbers, but this is the restriction we made to make the function 1 to 1. So just remember, that tells us that the inverse trig function is something that should take a value between negative 1 and 1 and give us back what we're thinking of as an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Notice what this says is that the sine function is accepting an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, which would be something from quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. Okay, what that means is when I evaluate the sine inverse function at a trig value, what I have to get back is an angle in quadrant 1 or an angle in quadrant 2. Okay, this is why in my calculator, if I take the sine inverse of 1 half, then of course I get pi over 6. If I take the sine inverse of negative one-half, I get negative pi over six. And of course, I know that pi over six is here, and negative pi over six is here. Notice on your calculator, if I type in sine inverse of one-half, the calculator is never going to spit out an answer of five pi over six. Okay, where is 5 pi over 6? 5 pi over 6 is here in quadrant 2, where this reference angle is pi over 6. Now it is true that the sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half, but it's not true that the sine inverse of 1 half is 5 pi over 6. Because of the restriction we've made, the sine inverse of 1 half is always the positive angle in quadrant 1. If we had not defined this this way,
the sine inverse function would not be a well-defined function. Sine inverse of one half would give us many, many different angles, and we only want one. The one we're going to get is in quadrant one. That's the nature of these restrictions, and it tells us that our answer should be in one of those two quadrants because of the range we've selected. Okay, so that means when I go to evaluate y equals sine x, our restriction will put x either in the interval negative pi over 2 to 0, or it will put our x in the interval 0 to pi over 2, 0 being the one point where those two intervals overlap. Okay, notice if x is in the interval 0 to pi over 2, and we're saying y equals the sine of x, or another way to think of that is sine x equals y over 1, then we know our angle should reside in quadrant 1. And if I drew a picture of that, that is... there's x and the sine of x is y over 1, I understand that that would be a reference triangle picture for this statement. I'm treating x as the angle, what you might think of as theta, and we're saying that if we take the ratio of opposite, and I'm sorry I put the 1 in the wrong place, let's correct that. Sorry about that. If I take opposite over hypotenuse, then, of course, the opposite side would be that vertical y hypotenuse. I'm treating that as 1, which means we're on a unit circle, and the sine of x is y over 1. Consider what will happen if x is in the other interval. Of course, now I know I'm in quadrant 4. And again, this is x. And now, of course, again, if sine of x equals y over 1, then I know if this is the angle x, then this should be y, and this should be 1. And, of course, in this case, y is going to be negative, whereas up here, y was positive. And this all comports with what we already understand about how to translate a basic sign statement into a reference triangle picture. Now, the thing I want you to think about in this picture for just a second, so let's draw that again. Well, translating directly from that picture, if that's x, and again, if that's y, and that's 1, so just to repeat it one more time, that definitely tells me that the sine of x is y over 1. What does it say about the cosecant of x. Well, again, not using the fact that cosecant and sine are reciprocals, but just looking at the picture, based on my definition, cosecant is supposed to be hypotenuse over opposite. In that picture, this certainly would be 1 over y. Okay, notice what this statement says. If sine of x is equal to y, that definitely means x is equal to sine inverse of y. What does this bottom statement say? Well, if I take the cosecant inverse function and apply it to both sides of that equation, I get x is equal to cosecant inverse of 1 over y. Okay, when I put those two together, what do I get? I get that cosecant inverse of 1 over y is equal to sine inverse of y. In other words, the cosecant inverse of a value is equal to sine inverse of the reciprocal of that value. Okay, now, if you've been taught this before, what's one of the basic uses of this equation? If I wanted to know what the cosecant inverse of, let's say, 2 was, well, most calculators don't have a cosecant inverse key, but they do have a sine inverse key. And what this identity says is the cosecant inverse of a number 
is equal to sine inverse of the reciprocal of that value, which in this case would be pi over 6. Now, I'll leave it for you to consider. I just verified this with the picture of our x being in quadrant 1, that is, x being between 0 and pi over 2. If x is in quadrant 4, that means if x is between negative pi over 2 and 0, this equation still holds. Okay, therefore, we have a very important identity. One that says, if I take the cosecant inverse of a number, it's equal to sine inverse of the reciprocal of that number. And you can write that however you like. You could also write it as sine inverse of y equals cosecant inverse of 1 over y. These two equations say the same thing. Notice, of course, that since the domain for the sine inverse function is negative 1 to 1, then that implies that 1 over y is either something less than negative 1 or greater than 1 since we're taking a reciprocal. So just as a reminder, and you know this from your experience in trigonometry, I can't ask a question like sine inverse of 2 because 2 is not in the domain of the sine inverse function. Similarly, I cannot ask a question like cosecant inverse of 1 half because 1 half is not in the domain of the cosecant inverse function. Cosecant inverse only accepts values that are larger than 1 or less than negative 1. Sine inverse only accepts things between negative 1 and 1. And this equation shows us why that's true. It's because one of those functions evaluated a number is equal to the other one at the reciprocal of that input number. All right, now, if you understand that, I'll just say without proof, because the verification would be similar, that similarly, the secant inverse of a number is equal to cosine inverse of the reciprocal of that number. And again, this would be true for x in the interval negative 1 to 1. Okay, so now we have two useful identities, just to summarize. We have that sine inverse of a value is equal to cosecant inverse of the reciprocal of that value on the appropriate domains. We have that the cosine inverse of a value is equal to secant inverse of the reciprocal of that value. The natural question would be, is there a similar rule for tangent? And the answer is, the rule's a little different for tangent. So for tangent, let's go to another page. Let's suppose we have y equals tangent x, which of course means x equals tan inverse of y. Let's compare that to what we would have if we had y equals cotangent of x, which would mean x equals cotan inverse of y. All right, for that second equation right there, where we're thinking about x equals tan inverse of y, let's think about the domain we defined a few minutes ago for the tan inverse function. And if you look back in your notes, you'll see that it was between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. In other words, the only kind of number that I'm allowed to plug into tan inverse is something that's in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. Meaning, I would have to have an angle there in quadrant 1 or an angle down here in quadrant 4. If, on the other hand, you go back and look at the domain restrictions that we came up with for cotan inverse, those were in quadrants 1 and 2. So, and this should be a y right here. So that y would have to be something in quadrant 1, or it would have to be something in quadrant 2. So first, let's consider y equals tangent of x. 
or in other words, again, x equals tan inverse of y. And we're saying there is one of two possibilities, and if you look at the picture right above it, we're saying that y could be between 0 and pi over 2, or that y could be in between negative pi over 2 and 0. In other words, the y could be positive, or the y could be negative. Well, if y equals the tangent of x, that means, again, I'm thinking of the angle being the x. And when I take the tangent of that, I get y, which I could think of as y over 1. Okay, that means when I fill in the pieces in that reference triangle in quadrant 1, if y equals tangent x, that means opposite over adjacent should be 1. If I was looking at the bottom reference triangle in quadrant 4, well, again, it would be opposite over adjacent, meaning they're sharing that adjacent side, whether it's the top reference triangle or the bottom reference triangle. Okay, now let's hop over to the cotangent graph for just a second. Same situation except our reference triangles are in quadrants 1 and 2. So if y equals cotangent of x, I could treat my x again as being the angle. So one of them would be there, uh, but be careful. Where would the other angle be? The other angle would be in quadrant 2, which means it would be this angle. Now, of course, the reference angle for that green angle is definitely the same x that I had over in the reference triangle in quadrant 1. And if cotangent of x equals y, since I know cotangent is adjacent over opposite, then of course that would put a y here and it would put a 1 there. And similarly for the angle in quadrant 2, there would be a y here and a 1 here. Notice that makes sense because this y on the right will be positive and this y on the left will be negative. Therefore, if y is positive, then cotan inverse of y will give me an x value that is in quadrant 1. If y is negative, then cotan inverse of y gives me an x value that's in quadrant 2, which is pi over 2 to pi. Now the question is, and the reason why we've looked at all this, can I make a statement like tan inverse of, let's say, x, or let's call it y in this case, is tan inverse of x equal to cotan inverse of the reciprocal of that input value? Question. Well, if I think about what happened right here, when y was positive for tan inverse, I got something in quadrant 1. Over here for cotan inverse, when y was positive, I got something in quadrant 1. Okay, so that looks good. What happened with tan inverse when I pick something less than 0? Well, when I pick something less than 0, where was my angle? It was in quadrant 4. Over here, when y was less than 0, what did I come up with for an output from the cotangent inverse function? I came up with something between pi over 2 and pi, which is in quadrant 2. Okay, do we see the problem? This equation is true if y is greater than 0, but not true if y is less than 0. Okay, and I want an identity that's going to work for all valid input values. So we don't actually ever list this as an identity, even though it is actually true for positive y's. So 
there is no identity like the two that we just had for cosine and secant and for sine and cosecant that is these nice two identities we had here so we come up with a slightly different one for tan inverse and cotan inverse and it is the following There is also a similar, similar formula for cosine inverse and sine inverse, namely sine inverse of x plus cosine inverse of x is equal to pi over 2, i.e. sine inverse x and cosine inverse of x are complementary. Let me prove that one to you quickly. Let x be in the interval negative 1 to 1, so that of course we're picking a number that's in the domain of sine and cosine. Let's let u equal the cosine of pi over 2 minus sine inverse of x. Okay, that means u equals the sine of sine inverse of x. Okay, why is that? Because the cosine of the complement of an angle is equal to the sine of that angle. So just imagine here, sine inverse is an angle, pi over 2 is the complement of that angle. So if sine inverse is an angle, pi over 2 minus that is the complement of that angle. And that should be equal to the cosine. So let's put it this way. The rule we're invoking here is the cosine of pi over 2 minus theta is equal to the sine of theta, meaning the sine of an angle is equal to the cosine of its complement. Okay, if I invoke that rule, then what I have now is that u is equal to the sine of the sine inverse of x. Restricted to its domain, I know that sine and sine inverse cancel each other out so that I get u is equal to x. Okay, but what was u? u was cosine of pi over 2 minus sine inverse of x. Let's apply cosine inverse to both sides of this equation. And of course, what happens on the left? Well, I'm putting cosine inverse and cosine together in a composition. When I do that, assuming that I'm on an appropriate restricted domain, I should just get back the argument on the inside. Well, in this case, that is pi over 2 minus sine inverse of x, and that equals, on the other side of the equation, cosine inverse of x. And of course, that's the same thing as saying sine inverse of x plus cosine inverse of x equals pi over 2, which is what we were trying to prove. So let's add that to our list here at the top of the page. Let's say that sine inverse of x is equal to pi over 2 minus cosine inverse of x. And now these are the four primary identities from this section that relate the various trig functions, inverse trig functions, to each other. There are the two reciprocal rules, and then there are these two complementary rules. And that's what we've got so far.
And that will about do it for the identities. So the only other thing we might want to look at is just a couple of quick examples on how to evaluate combinations of inverse trig functions. So let's look at a couple of examples. Let's look at something like find the exact value of the sine of 2 times cosine inverse of 3 fifths. Actually, let's make that negative 3 fifths. Okay, let's make sure this all makes sense to us. The outer function is a sine, which means everything inside here should be a real number that I can view as an angle. Well, I know cosine inverse would give me an angle. In fact, what does cosine inverse do, just to remind us? Cosine inverse is something that should take a trig ratio and give me back an angle. And actually, what did we say about cosine inverse? We said its domain is negative 1 to 1. And the output we get should be something in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. In other words, something between 0 and pi. All right, now is where you need to get used to drawing reference triangle pictures. If this y value is negative, and I'm taking cosine inverse of that, then I just have to ask the question, which one of these two quadrants should I be in? if the value I'm taking my cosine inverse on is negative? And the answer is I should be in quadrant 2. Okay, if I am in quadrant 2, that means when I draw a reference triangle for that angle, the actual angle is this guy right here in green. That is my actual cosine inverse of negative 3 fifths angle. But just make sure you understand that cosine inverse of positive 3 fifths would be an angle here in quadrant 1. But since that value I'm inputting into the cosine inverse is negative, I'm going to get that number in quadrant 2, or that angle in quadrant 2. Now, of course, what does the negative 3 fifths give me? It gives me a ratio of adjacent to hypotenuse. And I can see pretty clearly that if this is the reference angle, this should be negative 3 for the adjacent, and that should be the 5 for the hypotenuse. And then using a little Pythagorean, of course, I know that one should be positive 4. All right, now when I look at that picture, I can clearly see several things. And let's just quickly write them down just to make sure we, we see it. I definitely see that in that picture, the cosine of let's call this angle theta that is let's call theta cosine inverse of negative three-fifths I can definitely see that the cosine of theta is negative three-fifths you should be able to see that the sine of theta is positive four-fifths you should be able to see that the tangent of theta is negative four-thirds and obviously, if I can get those three, then I can get the three reciprocal functions. The secant of theta should be negative 5 thirds. The cosecant of theta should be 5 fourths. The cotangent of theta should be negative 3 fourths. All right, now, let's go back to our problem. I'm trying to take the sine of an angle, but I don't have just cosine inverse. There's a 2 in front of it. All right, the way around that, is to think about identities. Do I know anything about how to handle a situation generally in trigonometry that looks like the sine of 2 times an angle? Is there a way to get rid of that too? If I start thumbing through the identities, it doesn't take me long to land on 2 times sine of theta times cosine of theta. And notice what we're saying now is we can express the sine of 2 theta, where the argument of this function isn't just theta, it's got that 2 attached to it, 
we can actually express it in terms of just basic trig function factors, just sine theta and just cosine theta. If I can do that, then I know from this triangle that I can write out what the sine of this angle is. It's 2 times the sine of theta, which is 4 fifths, times the cosine of theta, which is negative 3 fifths, which means I get negative 24 25ths. So there are really two parts to doing one of these evaluations. One is drawing the correct picture, making sure you have a reference triangle drawn in the correct quadrant, making sure you get your signs correct. Then, if I'm doing something like evaluating sine at some, let's say, inverse trig function, but possibly with a number in front, I may have to appeal to some trig identity. And let me quickly show you a couple other examples just to show you other similar things that could happen. So let's look at another example. Uh, let's say we had something like find the exact value of secant of tan inverse of negative 3. And let's see if we can do this one. So again, how we should start thinking about this is when I look at that statement, I'm immediately viewing that as secant of theta because I know tan inverse is really giving me an angle or a number that I think of as an angle. Actually, what does tan inverse really do? It takes something from a domain of all real numbers and gives me back a number between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, since the number I'm plugging into the tan inverse function is negative, what quadrant does that put me in? Well, if tan inverse puts me between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, it means my angle is either in quadrant 1 or it's in quadrant 2. Well, I know in quadrant 1, tangent is positive, and I know in quadrant 2, tangent is negative. And I know that this says if theta equals tan inverse of negative 3, that that's the same thing as saying tangent of theta equals negative 3. If tangent is negative, I must be in quadrant 4, and I did mean to write quadrant 4 there. All right, so... The correct picture should be a reference triangle drawn in quadrant 4. And obviously there's the theta in my picture. And I am saying ta tangent of theta equals negative 3. So I could think of that as negative 3 over 1. And if tangent is the opposite over adjacent, I could think of this as negative 3 and think of that as 1. And of course, if I do a little quick Pythagorean, I know that this hypotenuse would have to be square root of 10. And you should see, as in the last example, I should be able to calculate from that picture sine of theta, cosine of theta. Uh, let's just write them down quickly. Sine of theta would be opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. And that should make perfect sense. If I'm in quadrant 4, I know that cosine should be positive because that's like the x-coordinate. And I know sine should be negative because that corresponds to the y-coordinate. So these signs make sense. All right, now, what are we looking for? We're looking for the secant of this angle. Well, that's easy. That should just be the reciprocal of cosine. So what's the secant of theta in this one? It's the reciprocal of 1 over square root of 10. Okay, didn't need to pull out any identities. This one was a more straightforward, just uh, put that trig function together with that inverse trig function and extract the correct trig ratio from the reference triangle picture. Let's look at another one. And we'll make this our last example, just to show you another one where I have to use some trig identity. So let's find, again, another exact value 
of cosine of cotan inverse of 3 fourths plus cotan inverse of negative 5 twelfths. And hopefully you're starting to catch on to the, to the perspective you should have here, which is when I see this cosine on the outside and on the inside I see this cotan inverse plus another cotan inverse. Once I see an inverse trig function, I should immediately be thinking of these two as angles. And so what I really see there is the sum of two angles, which means what I really have here is the cosine of the sum of two angles. And once I view it that way, it should jump out at me what to do once I go back and look at my list of trig identities. So of course you can pull up a list like that online or in the back of your calc book there's a reference table with the most common trig identities. But if you look through that it won't take you too long to find the one that seems to fit for this. In fact you may remember it. The cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta. Okay, that means all I need to do yet again is draw the correct reference triangle and the correct quadrant. And then basically if I can calculate these four things, I'll have my answer. All right, so the question is, uh, where am I if I'm thinking about alpha equals cotan inverse of 3 fourths and I'm thinking about beta equaling cotan, cotan inverse of negative 5 twelfths? Well, first of all, go back and think about cotan inverse for a minute. And we know that cotangent has a range of 0 to pi, that is something in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. So really of course we're talking about two parts, 0 to pi over 2. Or pi over 2 to pi. Oops. Okay, so what do I know then when I look at these two angles? Well, this first one says that cotangent of alpha equals 3 fourths, and the second one says that cotangent of beta equals negative 5 twelfths. Okay, this equation says that alpha is in quadrant 1 and the second one says that beta is in quadrant 2. Okay so that means this time I have two different pictures. I have one for alpha where alpha is an angle in quadrant 1 and of course I know cotangent is adjacent over opposite so adjacent over opposite Whereas the picture for beta would be an angle in quadrant 2, which would look like this. But the reference angle, of course, is right here. And again, cotangent is adjacent over opposite. So adjacent over opposite. And notice the sign on the negative 5 is correct since my x-coordinate is negative. Okay, now, when I go back up to what I'm trying to evaluate here, I'm trying to evaluate cosine of the sum of these two angles, which is the cosine of alpha plus beta, which we said was equal to this using our sum identity for cosine. And the question is, can I extract the sines and cosines of alpha and beta from these two pictures? 
and of course I can. Let's just write it out. So if I write out what cosine of alpha is, let's look at that one first. Well, that would come from this first picture. What do I need to calculate cosine? Well, I need adjacent and I need hypotenuse, which means I would need the hypotenuse on this triangle, which I know is 5. So cosine of alpha would be adjacent over hypotenuse, which would be 3 fifths times cosine of beta. Okay, cosine of beta would have to come from this other picture. And again, I need the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse should be 13. And from that picture, I can see that the cosine of beta would be negative 5 twelfths. Okay, now let's just finish the rest of the formula. Minus sine of alpha, which should be 4 fifths, times sine of beta, which should be 12 thirteenths. And if I calculate this, what I should end up with, if I did my math right, you can check me. I came up with negative 63 over 65. Okay, hopefully these last few examples give you something to go on in terms of how to evaluate these combinations. But that's mostly what your homework is going to be about, is getting the feel for how to put these trig functions together with inverse trig functions in various simple combinations. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll stop there for this lesson.